As he prepares for a historic comeback, I'll speak to Malaysia's Prime Minister-in-waiting and former prisoner Anwar Ibrahim, and also to legendary US investigative journalist Seymour Hersh. I'm Mehdi Hassan. He's been described as the last great American reporter, and he's just written his memoir. But why does Seymour Hersh think the media's attacks on Donald Trump are misguided? And is he really now a defender of Bashar al-Assad? I'll ask him. But first, after years of imprisonment on what was seen as trumped-up charges, former Malaysian Deputy Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim is free, while former Prime Minister Najib Razak has been arrested again this week for abuse of power. Another former Prime Minister, Mahathir Mohamad, is back in charge, but he says he'll hand over power to Anwar in a couple of years. But will he really? And can this new governing alliance hold? This week's headliner from Kuala Lumpur, Anwar Ibrahim. Anwar Ibrahim, thank you for joining me on Upfront. This year has been a bit of a roller coaster for you, hasn't it? In May, you were released from prison uh, after three years behind bars on what are widely considered to have been trumped up charges. Your opposition coalition defeated the ruling BN coalition for the first time in 60 years and is now in charge. And you're widely considered to be the prime minister in waiting. Did you think six months ago that this is where you'd be today? Certainly not, Mehdi. Um, I was optimistic that we will secure victory, but I did not envisage this much uh, enthusiasm expressed by the Malaysians and the fact that uh, now I'm uh, a free man. And you're not just a free man, you're the de facto leader of Malaysia's new ruling coalition, the Pakatan Harapan Coalition. You've joined forces with Mahathir Mohamed, the former prime minister, now prime minister again, who's gone from being your ally to your arch enemy to your ally again. He's the man who supported your first conviction and imprisonment on these ludicrous corruption and sodomy charges, uh, many said were politically motivated. How can you trust a man like that? How can you work again with a man like that? Mother is now 92. He um, came up to me and said, Anwar, let's work together to save the country and rid the country of corruption, abuse of power. I took time. It is not a personal arrangement between Anwar and Mahade, but uh, he has shown remarkably well in terms of defending and uh, uh, the, 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 the reform uh, agenda. And now he has shown his uh, commitment uh, to the reform. And I have no reason to uh, suspect uh, um, other motives, because at that age, with that commitment, I think we should then allow him. Uh, and f for the last four months, we have been proven right. Um, he seems to be consistent, effective, and uh, that's why I and the party s support him totally. You say you support him totally. Uh, the coalition's plan, I believe, is that he will remain prime minister for one or two years and then cede the premiership to you. Uh, not only does that make you a prime minister in waiting, it also means that all of your future is dependent on basically Mahathir's goodwill, on Mahathir sticking to his word. What makes you so confident that he'll step down? Because even he said it's not fixed in stone, it's not kind of written in blood. There's no way you can force him to stand down if he doesn't want to, if he wants to stay on till he's 100. You continue to harass him when he's going to resign. Naturally, his response would be, let me stay. I have a task to perform. But what is important, Mehdi, is there was a written agreement uh, signed in 2015 by all the leaders. And I see no reason why I should uh, even demand or, or harass him to uh, resign earlier. Because... I think what he's doing now is important, and I have at least some latitude myself to go around, meet old friends, relax a bit, you, you, enjoy you, myself you say that. as a free man. You say, that you're, with the family. you say that you're enjoying yourself Naraj. and relaxing, and yet when you were released in May, you said you weren't interested in a cabinet position in Mahathir's government. You said, quote, you wanted to take some time with the family, some space. Uh, you said you, you, know, you wanted to go on speaking tours, and yet now you've announced you're going to run for parliament in a by-election. What changed your mind? You say you wanted to relax, but it looks like you're desperate to get back into politics quickly and, I guess, be prime minister sooner than later. <laughs> Mehdi, I was 
uh, in prison total to ten and a half years. And what do you do? Read and relax. Now, four months have passed since the last elections. And I think um, it's time for me to enter Parliament to assist in parliamentary reform. My understanding with Mahathir is that you conduct the affairs of the state, but let me then um, ensure that parliamentary reform is effective. As of today, September 2018, who do you think the majority of Malaysians would prefer to be their prime minister? You, Anwar Ibrahim, or Mahathir Mohamed? Well, there's no surveys conducted, but I'm happy that Mahathir is now the prime minister. He has an, uh, a major task. Uh, he ha we need a, a tough, a firm leader for now, and he's doing extremely well. I wouldn't mind if uh, Malaysians generally endorse that. I think he's immensely popular. And um, I would uh, grant that. I don't have qualms about this. I don't need to be an apologist to suggest uh, otherwise. It's been called one of the world's biggest financial scandals, the 1MDB scandal, um, in which former Prime Minister Najib Razak, who is a supporter of your second uh, imprisonment, uh, he was arrested this week again uh, over additional charges of abuse of power. Um, Mahathir has called it an almost perfect case against Najib, who's also facing charges of bribery, theft of government funds, embezzlement. Uh, Mahathir says he holds Najib totally responsible for the 1MDB scandal. Do you as well? Yes, um, I first raised this issue in Parliament in 2011. And uh, I have stood by it throughout the years till I was arrested and uh, imprisoned in 2015. That Najib was responsible. He chaired many of these meetings. He uh, instructed clearly the authorities to then disburse the funds. And it is atrocious. I mean, it is one of the worst financial scandals involving any government. And um, it is therefore uh, uh, Im Im uh, Im uh, imperative that action, stiff action, be taken. But then since this is new government have said and assured, pro uh, investigations must be professional, prosecution must not be malicious, and the judiciary okay. must be independent. <clears throat> so we'll have to wait. People were getting impatient. But then we had to wait. We have to go by the pro due process and the law. As someone who's been tried and convicted twice of sodomy, a sentence that can lead up to 20 years in prison, uh, it can lead to whipping under Malaysian law, you told the Wall Street Journal back in 2012 that Malaysia's sodomy laws are, quote, archaic, that they should be amended. You said, quote, it's not my business to attack people or arrest people based on their sexual orientation. Do you still stand by that? Will Malaysia be repealing its sodomy laws once you're prime minister? Yes, uh, I've said it, I maintain this. Uh, this is uh, 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 not only archaic, it is the British colonial laws introduced in India and replicated in Malaysia. It is completely um, uh, unjust because one can be just accused and um, without any proper evidence or, in my case, clearly. But then what is important is if we have a case against uh, homosexuality, then it must be done in a transparent manner. The laws must be amended to secure, uh, to ensure there's justice in the process. And it's not a matter of sexual orientation. It's what you perform or you display publicly, uh, which is against the norms of majority of Malaysians, not only Muslims, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists alike in this country. OK, well, on that note, you, say, you rightly say that it's a British colonial law, uh, and yet last month, I mean, there is a Muslim angle as well, so many would say, last month, the Deputy Prime Minister, Wan Aziza, who also happens to be your wife, was quoted as saying it is haram, it is forbidden for Muslims to support the LGBT community or their fight for equality in Malaysia, that they must keep their practice behind closed doors. Uh, just a couple of days earlier, you were quoted as saying, if people have their own sexual orientation, it's up to them. Who should Malaysians, especially Muslim Malaysians, listen to on this issue? The Deputy Prime Minister, your wife, or the Prime Minister in waiting, you? <laughs> Aziza is an intelligent uh, leader in her own right. What she said precisely was that the uh, sexual act is haram, and that is not disputed in any Islamic text or religious text. 
I don't see a contradiction between my views and hers on this. We both, uh, I have condemned the, even the caning of lesbians by the Islamic Party state of uh, Tranganu because I thought this is clearly unjust, although they use Sharia as a basis. We cannot defend such uh, okay. uh, um, action. Okay. I want to ask about your relationship with Turkey's president, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Uh, in a recent interview, you described Erdogan as, quote, the most popular leader among Muslims of Malaysia and outside Malaysia because of his position on Palestine and what happened in the Middle East. You said, quote, very few leaders of the world would have that courage to go and fight for justice like him. So does that mean that when you're prime minister, you'll be governing in a similar way to Erdogan? Is he your role model as a leader? He's a friend. I um, uh, support some of his policies, and I think, uh, given the, 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 the atrocious conditions in the Muslim world, run by dictators, I think uh, it is something, a breath of fresh air to see the success in, in Indonesia and in uh, Turkey, and in some ways, hopefully, Imran Khan in Pakistan. So I'm, I'm looking at that uh, way in the positive manner. I'm not in the position to defend all their, of their policies. Uh, remember that he ex experienced a coup d'etat that, that, that cost lives, including a very close brother of mine who was killed in that uh, coup attempt. I think the coup attempt has been condemned uh, all around the world, uh, but human rights groups point out that Erdogan's crackdown on his critics since the coup, locking up tens of thousands of soldiers and government officials, sacking thousands of judges and teachers, shutting down news organizations, restricting free speech, that these are abuses of power, these are human rights abuses. You don't condemn any of these crackdowns on the free press, on human rights groups like Amnesty? There's a Clearly, you are ignoring the hypocrisy in some of the foreign policy position taken even by the United States immediately after the attempted coup. Everybody knows that. I, I'm not, I'm not, no, it's no, not about you. the U.S. I've interviewed no. many U.S. <laughs> officials. I don't think anyone could accuse yes. me of going soft Precisely. on the U.S. I'm asking what about I'm saying, the crackdown Mahdi, No, Turkey. no, no. Will you Let condemn me that? Because there Will must be yes. not only the U.S., Mahdi. I'm talking about the crimes against humanity committed by many of the other Muslim countries were largely ignored because they were timid and uh, complicit with the, uh, some of the American policies. Now, let's be go back. Your question is whether he overreacted after the coup. I would say yes, but I think given time, he should ease. And that's what my uh, personal views uh, expressed to him. But then to ignore the fact that uh, there were hundreds of people killed this is, uh, to me, unacceptable. One last question, Anwar Ibrahim. You've said you forgive Najib Razak for what he did to you. You've obviously forgiven Mahathir, who you're now working alongside. There's not many people, there's not many politicians who, being in the position you're in now, would be talking forgiveness. They'd be looking for revenge or for justice, at least. How hard was it for you to forgive these people who helped lock you up? And where does that forgiveness come from? Well, it's a very painful uh, process. It's not, it wasn't easy. But finally, we talk about um, the country. We talk about uh, justice. Yes, we talk about compassion. And, and uh, from my religious beliefs, what is the relevance of religion if, if you do not promote compassion and, and willing to forgive? Me, Aziza, and my children had to suffer all these years, two decades. It's a long time. And we did suffer. But then, between these sufferings and the country, which is at stake, I choose the country. And I choose the country because I believe we can all affect change with this new attitude towards peace, towards compassion, towards justice, by our willingness to forgive. Anwar Ibrahim, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Everyone in journalism knows the name of Seymour Hirsch. When it comes to investigative reporting, the Pulitzer Prize-winning Hirsch is a legend. Over a career spanning more than five decades, he's broken story after story. The My Lai massacre during the Vietnam War, the Abu Ghraib torture scandal during the Iraq War. And in recent years, he's done some pretty controversial reporting on Syria, too. He's now written his memoir, aptly called Reporter. Seymour Hirsch, 
Thanks for joining me on Upfront. Your new book, Reporter and Memoir, is the story of one of the world's most impressive careers in investigative journalism. Your writing, I think it's fair to say, has helped change history. It's sent people to prison. It's won you lots of awards. Uh, it's generated a lot of controversy. So which story uh, that you broke over the past 50 years do you believe was the most important story, the most consequential story? Oh, uh, I love all my children. Come on. I can't make this. I don't one, make those differences. One must stand out. Well, really, the one, when you look obviously, back. the one that put me on the map was Milai. was I'd been in the business for eight or nine years. I'd been a police reporter in Chicago. And, and yet you write, you say that it didn't really change things. You acknowledge that at the time. Of course. I had hopes, you mm. know. But did I think that the war would end no. and everybody would declare, we're not going to do this anymore? We're not going to go and... No, that it wouldn't happen on the basis of even, no matter how big the story. You've been in journalism for over 50 years. You've now written this memoir. Does it frustrate you at all that... You seem to be winding down your career at a time when the news has never been more controversial and perhaps there's never been a greater need for investigative journalism, especially in the United States. Uh, I think it's going to hell. Now what you have is uh, if you don't like Trump, you read the New York Times and Washington Post and watch certain cable shows, yeah. CNN. If you like Trump, you watch Fox News and you read other papers. But they're not equal, though, are you? That's buying into a Trump narrative. Fox News is not the same as New York Times. New York Times still does good journalism but, in the way that Fox News but doesn't. But the credibility of the New York Times, because it's so hostile to him, maybe legitimately, but over the top, I think. They've gone way over the top in terms of, like, writing an anonymous letter. Do you believe that Trump is so hated and so controversial now that uh, he makes us forget about a lot of the controversial stuff that his predecessors did, too. You're one of those journalists who did cover many of the crimes and the cover-ups of George W. Bush and Barack Obama, especially on national security issues. Is that all in danger of being forgotten now uh, in this age of hashtag resistance and being anti-Trump? Of course, but I have to say, what I believe doesn't matter much. I mean, what the facts are is that... Um, um, we have walked away from some of the some of the problems. You know, 9/11 and the response to 9/11 was completely insane. The yeah. idea that you could fight an idea by declaring a war on terror and immediately moving from bin, from bin Laden, looking for him, immediately moving into we're going to stop uh, Saddam Hussein because we think he may have bombs. And by the way, one of the things I learned in my, all my you know 800 years of doing this stuff is when the CIA starts saying we have high confidence. High confidence that the w, that there are WMDs. Remember weapons yeah. of mass destruction in Iraq. High confidence, and so when they say again, as the Democrats go out saying, we have high confidence the Russians actually won the war, won the election. You know, they intervened, and that's why Hillary lost, not because she ran a terrible campaign or, or she wasn't very likable. Um, we lost because the Russians fixed the election somehow, some magical way. Okay. I'm troubled by all that. I, so I, I want more facts. The allegations that Russia intervened to sway the 20. 2016 U.S. presidential right. election, and that Trump and his campaign colluded with the Russians during that election. You're skeptical of both those claims. Why? I, I'm skeptical of the Russia. I'm because I have, I've been doing this for, as I say, hundreds of years. I have sources inside who are, I can't get into, who know the world of signals intelligence and other things. And uh, they're, hard, they're far from persuaded. Your sources are great. Over the years, we've known you've done broken some great stories with your sources. But the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New Yorker have some great correspondents, I think you would admit, doing this work. And their sources are telling them differently. The intelligence agencies themselves are saying differently. Even the bipartisan Republican-led Senate Intelligence Committee says Russia intervened in the election. Mm -hmm. So why should we believe you and your sources versus all the other evidence that says you, you, this you, happened? I, I, you're asking me for an opinion. I'm giving you an opinion. So you're skeptical of the I'm intelligence agencies' high confidence, say the Mueller me, investigation and indictments, no. the emails from Don Trump Jr., all of that. You just don't buy it. You don't no, think the no, Russians... You're, you're taking me way too far. I'm not saying that. I, I'm what I'm saying is that my experience with, with a community that says we have high confidence is high confidence to me sometimes means we really don't know Jack. Which is fair enough. So you could say That's that. But you've, saying. No, you've said, you've said in the past that it's preposterous, the ideas that the Russians uh, got involved in. I doubt if I use the word preposterous. Okay. Uh, it's one thing to be skeptical, some might say. And people admire your skeptical journalism. And we need skeptical journalism. But let's talk about Syria, which you've been writing about in recent years and taking a very different line to a lot of other reporters who have been writing about Syria. Uh, reporters on the ground, chemical weapons, weapons experts, human rights experts, UN investigators, they're in agreement that the Syrian regime has used chemical weapons against its own people, including in April of 2017 at Khan Sheikhoun. You, 
on multiple occasions have argued against those conclusions. In June 2017, you wrote in the German newspaper Welt am Sonntag that there was no sarin attack, that it was a conventional uh, bombing raid that hit a cinder block building controlled by rebel groups, the basement of which contained, quote, fertilizers, disinfectants and other goods. A lot of chemical weapons experts and others dispute that. They say you're wrong. They say you're basically pushing a conspiracy theory. What's your response to them? I, I wrote what I wrote, and I'm, I'm not backing off it. I mean, they're just... Nothing in the last year has changed your mind that's come out? No, I the mean... The Organization I, I, for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons I, I, produced a big report basically I, I, saying the, OP, the opposite of everything you said. I haven't written anything since I wrote the first story, but I was intrigued by the fact that the OPCW um, put out two or three reports within a month which is totally against their, it was if almost they were, they were, they were, within two weeks they put out a report saying we suspect that uh, serum was involved, which is totally out of line for all of the procedures. I know people who worked in that agency, I know people who were disenchanted by that because the OPCW violated its rules. It usually so takes a couple of months to so come to a conclusion. just to be clear, you think the OPCW are wrong about this? No, Human I, Rights Watch, Amnesty International, uh, the French experts who studied it, Hans Blix, who's not exactly a CIA stooge, who says it was probably an attack by gas by the Syrian government. They're all wrong and you've uh, got it right. It's just uh, you uh, and your intelligence source. I think uh, it was one I, source. I had a transcript of, of, a conversation between, of conversations yeah. between somebody very deeply involved in that operation and higher headquarters. Uh, I got it. Uh, it. It was shown to the London Review. It was one of the things that made them convinced that this was a big story, above and beyond the fact that the sources I use are sources that I've been using for a long time that had gone through fact-checking from The New Yorker for 20 yeah. years. Hold on. It's not as if I'm just inventing a new source. I have people I've worked with for many years. And there's a lot of more cooperation with us and the Russians on intelligence. And there was, there was going to be a meeting, a high-level meeting that was targeted. I, I'm, fortunately, it's very secret, the fact that we and the Russians still work closely together. So taking a step back from, from, the, from the, the details of this attack, a lot of people were taken aback with the general approach of your articles. Even the London Review of Books, which published your earlier stuff, didn't publish the serious stuff. Uh, LRB editor Adam Schatz, who you know has done a conversation with you, praised you in the past, said, and I quote, so depressing to see a reporter who exposed war crimes in Vietnam and Iraq become an apologist for war crimes by the Assad regime. Does that, uh, anybody's does that upset you? Um, the only thing I can say about Syria is that uh, we keep on talking about rebels. The rebels are pretty hardcore, um, uh, very tough no people. Sharia everything. law, if they ever take, and Bashar understands that if he loses this war, um, he's going to be like Mussolini with this throat cut, hanging from a lamp pole in, in Damascus with his wife and two children next to him. He, he understands that the, his father's regime, his regime is gone. ISIS or Al Nusra, there's another couple of other groups that are just as bad in terms of no tolerance for, for even other, other Muslims uh, will take over, which will probably trigger trouble from, from Iran and the Israelis. So he's in a war to the end. And he's fighting a war against, and the number of casualties uh, on both sides are pretty even, according to that's most people. Say not that's the case, not, according to most monitors who've studied but this But I stuff. can tell you there's a lot of studies I've seen that show okay. maybe, a, 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 he certainly lost an awful lot of people, he too. Has, and but the they vast killed, majority of the civilian casualties, according to most of the studies, uh, There are studies that are say it's, it's 45, 55. I've also seen that, too, well, let but me that's ask, still a lot. Well, on that subject, you said to The Independent this summer that he's fighting, quote, as close to a just war as possible. No, I don't Surely know if I you said can't, that. Well, I, that's the quote, The Independent News. You should ask them to correct it, because it's out there. I've stopped giving up people just, just, that. You agree that it's not a just war by There's any no, means? How could it be a just Good. war? Good. Um, that's the quote. But, I was shocked when I read it. Just, but I, I think many would argue that Assad is the cause of the conflict and committed more crime. Well, you, well, you disagree, but let me why, ask... Why, if a civil war starts, is he a cause? If the dictator is the person who opens fire on protesters, Arab Spring 2011? I mean, this is the problem with you. You do come across as an Assad sympathizer. That's not I a smear or attack. You, you've met him. You said you liked him. You said you thought he was going in the right direction. Do you worry that that may have given but a slant to your pieces on Syria? Are you kidding? I've been a reporter for 50 years, and I can separate what I think from what happens. And all I'm saying is from the very beginning, from the very beginning, uh, and uh, as you know, many of the initial groups were actually, the, the Free Syrian Army was real. There were a lot of people who couldn't stand him. He had failed terribly on human rights. He didn't do enough on human rights. They had a, 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 a drought in the farm areas. He didn't do enough. He didn't deliver on education. I was writing about all of this. There was nothing wonderful. He was not popular among many people, particularly the intellectuals. Uh, people were still afraid of him. Uh, he was a despot. Uh, are you kidding? I just don't think 
he's particularly any worse than what goes on any day in Saudi Arabia when it comes to, and they're all sort of in that same ballpark. And I never saw him as any more of a monster. They were all in this group of people that will kill, kill, kill to survive. Okay. Just before we finish, uh, you've become over the decades one of the most famous, one of the most respected, one of the most successful investigative reporters in the world. You are an inspiration to a lot of journalists, myself included. Were you surprised at how big a figure you became over the years? Did you set out to become famous when you were a copy boy at the City News Bureau of Chicago in 1959? Did you think, this is where my career will end up? Are you kidding? Of course not. Uh, but, but I did understand after Milai that I, I was in a different position. And I did understand that what I said uh, off the top, uh, extemporaneously, had more impact. And I did do that. Um, I happen to believe, I happen to believe in truth. So my truth about what's going on in Syria may be different than a lot of people's truth. War is a, the ugliest, miserable thing in the world. And I don't think we have a claim to fight at anybody or anybody else. That's all. Seymour Hirsch, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you for joining me on Upfront. It was fun.